Just a magnificent looking animal. He's only three meters long. Didn't have a mark on us. And gave us an opportunity to tag her. And he placed his tag perfect. The sensor on the shark's fin suddenly screamed a warning. Showed this profile going down the shelf to 580 m and then a huge temperature change. In a split second, the water temperature shot up from 46 degrees to 78 degrees. The depth gauge plummeted. One moment, the nine-foot great white was cruising near the surface. The next, she was being dragged nearly 2,000 feet into the dark, crushing depths of the Southern Ocean. This was not a glitch. The tag was inside a stomach. Scientists spent years analyzing this digital crime scene to find the killer. The culprit wasn't a myth. It was a monster were far worse than we imagined. Nine-foot shark gone in seconds. One of their subjects was a magnificent female great white. She measured nine feet from nose to tail. In the world of sharks, she was not a baby. She was a healthy, powerful teenager entering her prime. The team named her Shark Alpha. She was pristine without a scratch on her, a perfect specimen of an apex predator. The team carefully attached a sophisticated satellite tag to her fin. This device was not just a simple tracker. It was a black box for sharks. It was designed to record depth, light levels, and crucially, water temperature every single minute of every single day. The technology inside these tags is incredible. They are built to withstand the crushing pressures of the deep ocean and the corrosive power of salt water. They are programmed to detach after a set period, float to the surface, and beam their stored data to a satellite network. This allows scientists to see a 3D replay of the shark's life. For four months, everything went exactly according to plan. The tag pinged the satellite regularly. Shark Alpha was moving along the coast, diving for fish, hunting seals, and behaving exactly like a great white shark should. The scientists were gathering textbook data. It was boring. But in science, boring is usually good. It means things are working. Then, abruptly, the pattern broke. The signal vanished from the open water. Weeks later, the tag was found. It had not drifted away. It had washed up on a beach only two and a half miles from where Shark Alpha was first tagged. This was weird. Usually, when a tag detaches, it drifts with the currents for miles, sometimes ending up in different oceans. For it to wash up right back where it started felt ominous. When the researcher walked down that beach to pick up the small plastic device, he had no idea he was holding the evidence of a massacre. The physical condition of the tag was the first clue. It looked worn, battered, and bleached. It looked like it had been through a chemical bath, but the real horror story was hidden in the digital memory. The team plugged it into their computer and downloaded the timeline. As the graph appeared on the screen, the room went silent. The data showed Shark Alpha swimming at a normal depth in water that was 46 degrees Fahrenheit. That is cold, deep ocean water. The depth was steady. The light levels were consistent with daylight. Then instantly, the line on the graph shot up. The temperature did not rise gradually. It spiked. In a matter of seconds, the sensor went from 46 degrees to 78 degrees Fahrenheit. A jump of 32 degrees. There is almost nowhere in the open ocean where the water temperature jumps that high that fast. You would need an underwater volcano to create heat like that, and there were no volcanoes in the area. But the temperature was only half the story. At the exact same moment the heat spiked, the depth sensor went crazy. The shark, or rather the tag, was dragged down. It did not sink. It was pulled. It plummeted 1,900 feet into the abyss. This was a power dive. The descent was steep, fast, and violent. The data showed that for eight days, the tag stayed in the dark, moving around, while the temperature held steady at that hot 78 degrees. This was not a glitch. The tag was inside something. A nine-foot shark had been ambushed, overpowered, and swallowed. The digestion process had bleached the plastic casing. The data was irrefutable. Shark Alpha was gone. But the question that haunted the team was simple. What kind of monster is big enough to swallow a shark the size of a car? To do this, the predator would have to be colossal. It would need a mouth wide enough to engulf the shark, or at least the part with the tag, in a single motion. And get this, the attack happened near the Bremer Canyon. This is a notorious hot spot for biodiversity, a place where the continental shelf drops off into the true deep. It is a hunting ground for the biggest animals on the planet. The scientists knew they weren't dealing with a normal event. They were dealing with a predation event that defied the known laws of the marine food chain. A top-tier predator had been treated like a sardine. The search for the culprit leads to a terrifying realization. The problem with the 78 degrees clue. 
When the story of the super predator broke, the public was obsessed. Everyone wanted to know what killed the shark. The first and most popular suspect was the orca or killer whale. It makes perfect sense on the surface. Orcas are the only animals in the ocean that are widely known to kill great whites. They are intelligent. They hunt in packs and they are ruthless. In recent years, we have seen undeniable proof of this war. In South Africa, two famous male orcas named Port and Starboard have been terrorizing the shark population for years. These two are celebrities in the marine biology world, but for all the wrong reasons. They are serial killers. They act like a specialized hit squad. Their method is terrifyingly precise. They work together to corner a shark. Then they use their tails to create water currents or ram the shark, flipping it onto its back. What most people don't realize is that when a shark is flipped upside down, it enters a state called tonic immobility. It goes into a trance. It becomes paralyzed. It's a biological glitch that the orcas have figured out how to exploit. Once the shark is helpless, the orcas perform surgery. They bite the shark in the pectoral area, right near the fins, and squeeze out the liver. They only want the liver because it is full of fats and energy. It's like high-calorie shark butter. They leave the rest of the body to rot. This creates a phenomenon called the landscape of fear. When orcas arrive, great whites panic. They sense the chemical signals of a dead shark, and they flee the area immediately. In some cases, they don't return for months. So, was Shark Alpha a victim of an orca attack? It seems plausible. An orca is certainly big enough. A large male orca can weigh 10 tons. Swallowing a shark tag would be easy for them. But here is the catch. When the scientists in the Shark Alpha case compared the orca theory to their hard data, it just didn't line up. In fact, the data from 2003 directly contradicted the way orcas are known to hunt. Let's break down the inconsistencies because the devil is in the details. First and most importantly was the temperature. The tag recorded a spike to 78 degrees Fahrenheit. As we discussed, this matches the internal stomach temperature of a great white. It does not match an orca. Orcas are mammals. They are warm-blooded, just like us. Their internal body temperature is much higher, typically hovering between 96 and 100 degrees Fahrenheit. If an orca had swallowed that tag, the reading would have been at least 20 degrees hotter. 78 degrees is simply too cold for a mammal's core. That single data point is the alibi that clears the killer whale. Second, there was the method. The data from Shark Alpha showed the tag was swallowed and remained inside a digestive tract for eight days. This is not what orcas do. As the South African cases proved, orcas are picky eaters. They are specialists. They extract the liver and maybe the heart, and then they discard the rest of the carcass. They do not swallow a nine-foot shark hole tag and all. It's just not their behavior. The event that happened to Shark Alpha was not a surgical removal. It was a clean, efficient down-the-hatch event. Third, there was the dive. This is a big one. After the attack, the tag was pulled down 1,900 feet, while orcas can dive deep. They are air-breathing mammals. They have lungs. They must return to the surface to breathe. A rapid sustained plunge to that depth after a massive hunt just doesn't fit their physiological profile. They would need to surface to recover oxygen. Staying deep for days is physically impossible for them. And finally, there was the aftermath. When Port and Starboard showed up in South Africa, the sharks panicked and created a ghost town. The researchers in Australia looked for this after Shark Alpha's disappearance. They checked on the behavior of other sharks in the area. And get this, nothing changed. The other sharks in the region just kept on being sharks. They didn't flee. They didn't vanish. They just continued patrolling and hunting, as if nothing had happened. This suggests the event was a localized, isolated incident. It wasn't a changing of the guard where a new terrifying predator, the orca, had moved in. It was more like an internal dispute. The killer was hiding in plain sight, blending in with the locals. This meant the team had to look deeper into the shadows, hunting for prehistoric ghosts. With the orca ruled out, the investigation turned to the strange location of the attack. Shark Alpha was taken near the Bremer Canyon. This is a massive underwater gorge on the edge of the continental shelf. It's like the Grand Canyon, but underwater and pitch black. Canyons like this are deep water hunting grounds known for some of the ocean's most elusive creatures, including the giant squid and the even larger colossal squid. The idea of a squid battle is thrilling. It captures the imagination. Imagine a 40-feet colossal squid rising from a blackness. It has eyes the size of basketballs and a beak that can shear through steel cables. 
it wraps its tentacles around the shark. The suckers, lined with razor-sharp rotating hooks, dig into the shark's tough skin. The shark thrashes, but it's no use. The squid drags it down, down into the crushing pressure of the abyss, to be eaten at leisure. Explains the dive to 1,900 feet perfectly. That depth is the natural home of the squid. It explains the sudden disappearance. And squid are aggressive. They have been known to fight sperm whales. So, a shark wouldn't be off the menu. But here is the catch. Just like with the orca, the temperature data kills this theory instantly. Squid are invertebrates. They are cold-blooded. Their internal body temperature is identical to the water around them. If a squid had eaten the tag, the temperature would have stayed at a chilly 46 degrees. It would never ever spike to 78 degrees. A squid simply cannot generate that kind of heat. It's biologically impossible. So the kraken is innocent. This left the internet with one final favorite theory, the megalodon. People are obsessed with the megalodon. The idea that a 60 feet prehistoric shark is still hiding in the deep ocean is incredible. A megalodon would have no trouble swallowing a 9 foot shark. It would have the power, the size, and the appetite. Its jaws were wide enough to swallow a small car. For decades, people have theorized that this monster didn't truly go extinct. They say a population survived, retreating into the deepest, unexplored parts of the ocean, places just like the Bremer Canyon. This theory seems to explain everything. What could swallow a nine-foot shark hole? A megalodon. What could exert that much force in a single ambush? A megalodon. Some internet sleuths even argued about the temperature. Since the megalodon is an ancestor of the Great White, they claimed it might have had a similar warm-blooded circulatory system, which would explain the 78 degrees. It fits the drama. It fits the violence. But science has to deal with facts, not movies. There's absolutely zero evidence that megalodons are still alive. If a predator that big existed, we would see bite marks on whales. We would find fresh teeth embedded in prey. We would see them on sonar. A 60-foot shark cannot hide forever. The ocean is vast, but it is not that big. A creature that large would leave a massive footprint on the ecosystem. Relying on a prehistoric ghost to explain a modern data set is bad science. The researchers knew the answer had to be biological, not mythological. They had to find a creature that lives in the deep, eats big prey, and most importantly, has a warm stomach. The predator had to be something real, something that we know exists, but is behaving in a way we never expected. The clues were painting a picture of a monster that was frighteningly familiar. The answer was staring them in the face. How the wonderful net works. The researchers went back to the drawing board and looked at that critical 78 degrees, reading again. They asked themselves, what animal in the ocean has a stomach temperature of 78 degrees while swimming in 46 degrees water? The answer was shocking because it was so familiar. The only animal that fits that profile is a great white shark. What most people don't realize is that great whites are not like other fish. Most fish are cold-blooded. Their body is the same temperature as the ocean. If the water is cold, they are cold. They are sluggish in the depths. But great whites along with tunas and mako sharks have a superpower. They are regionally endothermic. This means they can warm up certain parts of their bodies. They have a complex web of veins and arteries called the reedy mirabile, which is Latin for wonderful net. It's a biological masterpiece. This net captures the heat generated by their massive swimming muscles and recycles it. Instead of letting that heat escape into the water through their gills, the blood vessels loop it back into their core. It warms up their eyes, their brain, and their stomach. This allows them to hunt faster and think clearer in freezing water. It makes them high-performance machines, but also helps them digest. A warm stomach digests food much faster than a cold one. Scientists looked at the charts. A digesting great white shark maintains a stomach temperature of almost exactly 78 degrees Fahrenheit. The match was perfect. Suddenly, the pieces fell into place. The temperature wasn't a mystery. It was a fingerprint. But what about the dive? The plunge to 1,900 feet, that is actually normal behavior for a large great white. After a massive meal, they often dive deep into the thermal layers to digest and cruise. They use the cold water to regulate their body heat while their stomach works overtime. It's the shark equivalent of a post-Thanksgiving nap. The fact that other sharks didn't flee makes sense, too. This wasn't a new species invading the territory. It was just a larger member of the same tribe. The super predator wasn't a monster from a fantasy novel. It was a cannibal great white. 
Now, cannibalism sounds shocking to us, but in the shark world, it's just Tuesday. Shark on shark attacks are actually quite common. It starts early. In the womb of sand tiger sharks, the embryos develop teeth. The strongest embryo will literally hunt and eat its brothers and sisters before they are even born. It's nature's most brutal battle royale. Only the strongest is born. In the wild, larger sharks eat smaller sharks. Bull sharks do it. Tiger sharks do it. And great whites do it. Is a dog eat dog world. Or rather, a shark eat shark world. But acknowledging it was a shark is only the first step. The real horror comes when you do the math on the size. To swallow a 9 feet 300 pounds shark in a way that the tag enters the stomach quickly, the attacker had to be huge. This wasn't a fight. The tag data showed no prolonged struggle. The temperature spiked instantly. This implies the 9-foot shark was swallowed whole or taken apart in huge chunks in seconds. The attack likely came from below. Great whites are ambush predators. They strike from the deep, using their dark gray backs to blend in with the gloom. The attacker likely saw Shark Alpha's silhouette against the surface light. It would have surged up with incredible speed, slamming into Alpha with the force of a freight train. The impact alone would have stunned her. Then the jaws closed. The scientists estimated the size of the attacker based on the metabolic rate needed to generate that heat and the sheer physics of the attack. The numbers they came up with were staggering. The predator was a giant beyond our understanding. 16 feet is a conservative estimate. So here is the deal. We know it was a great white, but how big was it? This is where the science gets truly terrifying. To eat a 9-foot shark, you need to be significantly larger than 9 feet. You can't fit a car inside another car of the same size. The predator needs a massive size advantage to make this kind of kill. The initial calculations by the research team suggested a shark at least 16 feet long and weighing over 4,000 pounds. That is the size of a large station wagon or a pickup truck. But many experts, including Dave Riggs, believe that is a conservative estimate. 16 feet is big, but does it eat a 9-foot shark in one go big? Maybe not. To ambush and consume a healthy 9-foot shark so easily, the predator might have been significantly larger. We are talking about a shark pushing 20 feet in length and weighing nearly 6,000 pounds. This is the size of the famous shark Deep Blue, one of the largest great whites ever filmed. A shark this size is a submarine with teeth. It would have a girth of over 8 feet its mouth would be a cavern. This changes how we view these animals. We usually think of great whites as surface hunters chasing seals near the beaches or leaping out of the water in South Africa. We see them on shark week breaching and biting cages. But this event suggests there is a different class of great white. These are the deep water specialists. These giants have survived for decades. They have grown massive on a high-protein diet of whales, squid, and other sharks. They patrol the dark canyons of the continental shelf, far away from our cameras and cages. They are smart, they are cautious, and they are incredibly dangerous. They don't waste time with small prey. They want big meals. Shark Alpha, despite being a formidable predator herself, was just a teenager who swam into the territory of a queen. She was a dominant predator in her own right, but she wasn't the dominant predator. She was eating fish. The thing below her was eating sharks. Is a terrifying thought. We look at the ocean and worry about what we can see. We worry about the fin breaking the surface. But the data from Shark Alpha proves that the real monsters are the ones we cannot see. They are down there in the dark, 1,900 feet below the surface. They are living by a code of violence that we are only just beginning to understand. The ocean is not a democracy. Is a dictatorship. And the biggest shark makes the rules. The super predator was simply a colossal version of the animal we already fear. It confirms that the one creature the great white shark fears is a bigger great white shark. And the craziest part, that shark is likely still out there. A shark that size has no natural predators. It doesn't get eaten. It just keeps eating, keeps growing, and keeps ruling the deep. So, do you think there are 25-foot sharks hiding in the deep ocean that we haven't discovered yet? And does the idea of a cannibal giant make you want to stay out of the water? Let us know your thoughts in the comments below. And if you enjoyed this deep sea mystery, hit that like button and subscribe for more true stories from the abyss. Thanks FPR watching.